Good evening. Okay, sound check. We're good. What a beautiful day the Lord gave us today, huh? It is a beautiful day. Well, we're going to have a, a time of prayer, and then we have a special uh, presentation tonight by David Phelps, Associational Minister of Missions, and uh, going to talk to you about the trip to Armenia, which we are, uh, uh, as a church, looking to get involved with also. So it's going to be an informational thing for that. So before we get there, though, let's uh, see what kind of prayer requests we have out here. Does anyone have any updates off of the prayer list that, that was put out today? If you look, you see some of the additions. Family and friends of Glenda Ensley on her recent death. Uh, Jenilyn Esquera with cancer on prayer group two. On prayer group number three, Liz Burling, an unspoken request, and Robert and Diane Girardi. Uh, Robert's recovering from his trigger finger surgery and Diane from the melanoma surge procedure she had done. On prayer group four, Roy Angles, cancer radiation treatment. Rocky Cummings, recovering from a triple bypass. And Rick Loy, uh, Rick's back on again. He had, he had, he had dropped off there last two weeks, but uh, he's been added back on, uh, still dealing with the cancer, the, the leukemia. He actually has two types of leukemia, and his kidneys are now uh, failing. So are there any others? Jimmy? Who is this again, please? He's on here already? Okay. I don't have Scott's hearing anyway, Nate, so yeah. <laughs> Jimmy again. Jenny Stapler. Jerry Stapleford. Oh, okay, I, I know who that is. Yeah, Jerry Stapleford, Barbara. Okay, all right. He has COVID. Uh, there was an update that came out about Joanne Skorsky. Uh, she's uh, procedure is, is, is uh, it was done, and she is now uh, through some of the therapies able to do some different things, more movement. But she still has four weeks to go before she's out of the hospital. But uh, there's a praise for that. Mike. Okay. All right. All right. So, update your list. Mike can be removed. God has answered prayer for his back issues. Any others? Lisa? So is this Janice or Janet? Janet, Janet uh, struggling with alcoholism. It seemed to be a long-term thing for her. And uh, is still in need of uh, healing for that addiction. Barbara, you had a hand up? I, yeah, I... I there was a message came out, but I didn't see all of it. Mary Hughes. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Our, uh, our delegation to the convention is traveling home tomorrow, uh, early start to get back tomorrow night. Uh, some of them might be leaving tonight. I'm not sure who all are traveling together or not. Uh, definitely need to lift our convention up after uh, what's transpired this week. So we'll, it is in the Lord's hands as it always has been. And we'll continue to trust in him to lead. Any others? All right, if not, let's uh, go to the word and prayer. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for allowing us to gather in your house, to gather together as people with one accord, and that accord is your son, Jesus Christ, as our personal savior. And Father, as we place our trust in, the, in your, your love and your grace, we know we can bring these concerns to you. We know that the answer is already there, Father. But Father, we lift up to you all of these who are on our, our prayer list, but also the ones mentioned tonight specifically. And Father, we just commit them to your hand. And Father, we pray that we would be able to see your will be done and accept your will in each one of these situations. We lift up our, our pastor, uh, Scott and John, and, and, the, and the rest of the delegation who went to Nashville for the Traveling Mercies coming home to us. And Father, we'll just be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in all the things we say and do tonight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We do have a special guest tonight, David Phelps, the associational boss, I guess is what he told me, is he runs the association. Uh, he is here to talk about the mission, Armenian missions. Uh, so David, without further ado. Thank you, Sam. Boy, I like this microphone. It really picks up. So, I mean, I, it's so good. I mean, his hair goes back like that when I speak. It is, I appreciate Brother Scott inviting me to speak tonight. And um, um, when Sam asked me, you know, what do you do? I said, what's your role there? I said, I said well, I'm the boss, but actually I'm not. Um, I'm the lowest point in the triangle because, uh, um, you see, the church is the bride of Christ. It was made by him. A denominational agency is made by man. But those that keep true to the word of God shall be sustained and shall last. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing, I've not read much, I will not talk much about the Southern Matters Convention because it'll be in an uninformed opinion and there's a lot of that going around anyway. But, um, but I'm thankful for your pastor and any delegation you have at the convention. And I, if we did not have the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention, I mean, excuse me, the annual meeting of the Atlantic Baptist Association tomorrow night, I'd be crashing the deacons meeting to hear the report. But nevertheless, it is an honor to be with you. Um, how many of y'all know what Armenia is? You're a rare bird. <laughs> Armenia is a country, leave it right there with my friend, it's a country the size of the state of Maryland. Armenia is landlocked, as you can see, and they have 78% unemployment. When the, the churches there are thriving, one thing that will be of interest is that when and we in America will say, well, we can't do that, it's not in the budget, they don't have a budget. They say, what does God want us to do? And they do it. And they get so much done without any money than we do with our millions. Is astounding. We have been going, North Carolina Baptist men, now it's called Baptist on Mission, have been going to Armenia since 2004. And the exploratory team went in 2003, 2004, we've been going. I just got back from Armenia a week ago, and Dr. Joe Olishe, who's also with me, um, also went. He um, has pastored three churches that I know of in North Carolina, Georgia, and New Jersey. He jokes about having to go to language school before he went to New Jersey. And um, because he has his PhD and um, very, very excellent in his discipleship. What's transpired in Armenia, our goal was to plant 25 new churches, but what has transpired has been 77. And actually, there's more than that. There are actually more than that in the sense of preaching posts, little churches that have 5 to 15 that you get a church planner in a, in a geographic area, and then he gets preaching posts, and these preaching posts as he mentors other men to... Um, 
to be pastors takes over. So really we're looking at close to 149 potential churches now. The Lord is doing a great work in a very difficult neighborhood because you can see um, you have Azerbaijan to their east, Turkey to their west. Those are both mortal enemies. To the north is Georgia. Georgia is about 50% Islamic. And, the, and to the south is Persia. I'm avoiding saying the name of that country. But um, Persia is to the south. And the uh, thing is, they would rather trade than fight the Armenians. So um, this last fall, Azerbaijan attacked Armenia. For that special, you see within Azerbaijan, there's a light-colored area there. Do you, can you see that? That is called Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenians call it Artsakh, has been part of Armenia since um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's where we've been taking teams of the Atlantic Baptist Association. So technically, we are in Azerbaijan, the Shiite Muslim country. We have two active churches there that we support. Uh, we have fully funded two church planters. One of these church planters actually is mentoring seven young men in their early 20s, early to mid-20s to be future pastors. The, the Lord is doing a great work there. It's an area about the size of Rhode Island. But in the war this last fall, Azerbaijan, attacked they and Turkey really Turkey was behind this more than Azerbaijan or as much as Azerbaijan they brought in ISIS ISIS fighters the Islamic State has put on their list a couple of three, three years ago they wanted to destroy Armenia because they want only Islam in the area and so the genocide that happened a hundred years ago really has never stopped um, it has been slow and paused but if they have their way the Russians are there protecting the Armenians from the Turks and the Azerbaijan, and in five years they're going to pull out. And if that happens, I fully expect to see them continue to go with the um, the genocide. President Biden has recognized the genocide. I'm thankful for that. And um, Armenia knows that they're the. Let me tell you this: Armenia is the only Christian nation in that region. They will not allow a mosque to be built in their country. And Armenia knows that this is a spiritual war, not just a war over territory. They have fought through the centuries with Islam. They refuse to kowtow, kowtow down to Islam. The Baptist seminary that the Atlantic Baptist Association is building is in that part called Nagorno-Karabakh, there in Azerbaijan. We have, we have purchased the property. We've, we've purchased remodeling materials. During the war this last fall, it had, it had secondary blast, a, a bombshell hit, not, fairly close to the church. And um, there was no structural damage, but it blew out the windows. But um, this, the building we bought needs, is being remodeled. So we will be going, it's August, and hopefully some of us, some of the men will be going into this area to work on a construction team and starting the building of this church and the wall around it. This will be equipping Baptist ministers in the southern part of Armenia and also from Persia. That is what you are doing. See, the Atlantic Baptist Association doesn't just serve the churches. It is the churches. You are my boss. I serve you. It's not about what are you doing to serve the Atlantic Baptist Association. It's what are we doing to help enable you to build the kingdom of God. That's what the purpose of a seminary is, is to equip, biblically equip pastors to build the kingdom of God and to build the church. What is transpiring now in Armenia because of the war with Azerbaijan and Turkey is you're seeing a revival and a turning to the Lord in a deeper way and more and more professions of faith are happening at a geometric rate. And um, so we're very excited. We had our team go. We had several professions of faith. The team we went, we went the, the team that went um, two weeks ago for two weeks um, was a revisioning team mostly. But we also did vacation Bible school to go and canvas the northern part of the country to meet with pastors hear their heartbeat, and also see these children in these Bible schools we've been reaching and these day camps that we've been reaching are now becoming young adults, and we need discipleship processes and models to help raise them up, raise up leaders that the church can take off really big time. 
And so that's a lot of what's transpiring now. That's why we had the visioning trip this last week when we got back from Armenia. So continue on with a slide or two as, we, as I'm as wrapping up. And I'll let Joe, Dr. Joe take over for a little bit and now wrap it up. So the Lord is doing a fantastic, amazing work in Armenia. You see many Syrians going to Armenia now um, who are evacuating because of ISIS in Syria. So a lot of Armenians that have been living in Syria have come back, so they're starting Syrian churches too. So the Atlantic Baptist Association is getting ready to start as soon as the Missions Development Council approves. We will begin funding a pastor full-time in Armenia who is Syrian to help reach the tens of thousands of Syrian refugees who have flooded into the country because of ISIS. Y'all, the Lord is doing a great work. You know what missions really is? Missions is going to where God is at work and bringing him into clear focus. God is already at work there. So um, um, just as we are faithful in our Jerusalem, we are also being faithful to the uttermost parts of the earth. It is my hope as we have, a t we have a team from the Atlantic Baptist Association go this August that you will be in prayer for it. We have not bought our plane tickets yet, but we'll hopefully be buying those Monday. And if you want to go and teach children in Bible school or, or especially teach women or men in discipleship, disciple them, you can get your name in the hat if you let me know by Sunday. And I hope maybe you'll consider it. It's $2,500, includes all expenses except your Cokes and personal souvenirs. Dr. Joe Olashe has come to our association three years ago. He has done a lot of pulpit supply. He's retired, but you know, old preachers never die. They just get promoted. You serve until the Lord calls you home. And um, so Joe has been doing pulpit supply, preaching in, in um, discipleship. And uh, he's going to share some of um, his experience in Armenia as we just got back. And he's, uh, um, I don't want to steal your thunder if I say too much, but he is hopefully going to be bringing discipleship processes to Armenia to help equip these young men and young pastors who are getting started to be better at making disciples. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I just found out this morning I was going to be here, but uh, this was my first trip, obviously. And uh, let me say, first of all, you heard the numbers that David presented. It's amazing what God has done there uh, since 2003 and 2004. Uh, the goal was, uh, you know, 20 something churches and now there's over 70. And um, so we, uh, they, they contact, the team kind of contacted me late, uh, the seminary, they wanted teachers for the seminary, and uh, uh, I'm a part of an organization called TNET International, and uh, we, we train churches in discipleship in 43 countries. And um, so I had the opportunity of teaching Monday and Tuesday in the seminary. They're tremendous young men, sharp young men, uh, excited about the future of Armenia with what I'm seeing there. So had the opportunity of sharing corporate discipleship, how the church sets themselves up to uh, help people walk the path of, of discipleship, and uh, had the opportunity to teach with Steve Davis, another pastor here. He was speaking in the mornings on uh, personal spiritual transformation, and, and really, you have to be a disciple to make disciples. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to bottleneck the process or produce a, a disciple that's not a disciple. So we had the opportunity of teaching together. Uh, there's a lot of history here. By the way, if you would like to read the history of this area, uh, Philip Jenkins has a book called The Lost Christianity, The History of Lost Christianity. And uh, it's all about this region. Uh, most of this region was orthodox and uh, has just been inundated with Islam. And um, this, uh, that, that will give you a great history. Much, there's been a lot of martyrdom, a lot of genocide, uh, over over centuries, and uh, it will give you a glimpse of what, what is happening. Now, I didn't know what to expect, but I did find out from folks who've been there. Sam had been there 15 times, Danny had been 10 times, and their comment was they had never seen the people like this, and I had nothing to compare that with. But obviously, with Russia stepping in and stopping what was happening, uh, and no one else even bothered with it, uh, these folks know that um, it could happen again at any time. And who's really going to be there in that, in that situation? And they're living with that. In fact, the first Sunday I was at Central Baptist in Yerevan, and uh, I was preaching with our team leader, Paul. And um, as we made our way off the pulpit, the pastor caught a couple in the aisle and uh, prayed with them. And as he came back to us, he said, uh, that, that couple just lost their son in the, in the war. And then we went into a side room to a little conference room. Here was a grandmother, a mother, and two beautiful little girls. And uh, he told us the husband's been captured. 
the Red Cross says he's not dead, he's MIA. And um, it, it, it's touching lives there, and they're living with this now. So pray for the people of Armenia. A lot of history, you're right in the shadow of Mount Ararat, and um, a lot of great things to see, but it's the people who will grab your heart. And uh, having been to the orphanage and given gifts from the young children to the older gentlemen that uh, came to the glasses distribution and needed and needed prescription glasses, could, couldn't see well. And uh, Lisa was working on that, and she handed him a pair. He put that pair on, his face absolutely lit up. And he just reached over and grabbed Lisa's hand, and the interpreter said, perfect. So as he handed the glasses back to Lisa to clean, uh, he, I, I, that's when I had my phone ready and I snapped the picture. But he's standing there with his hat in his hand, his hand is over his heart, and uh, he just has this look of, of gratitude on his face. Uh, they had been to a service, clearly heard the gospel, and now they were given glasses, even reading glasses. We take these things for granted. We can buy them almost anywhere, reading glasses, and yet they can't afford them. And um, so just that opportunity to do that, he was given a gospel track, as each one of them were, and then they, as he was given the crochet cross, I, he kissed it. Now, I know that's an orthodox thing, but I think at that moment it was a thankful thing. Here was a team who came showing the love of Christ, sharing the gospel, but also in a practical way, meeting a, a very special need. So if you have the opportunity to go, I wanna encourage you to go. If you don't have that opportunity, I wanna encourage you to pray. These are a forgotten people and um, pray for them, pray for revival. Uh, I will say this, these churches, uh, I, I was in Yerevan, then we went up to Lake Savan. Uh, we were down south, I don't know where, <laughs> but I think these churches are strategically located across this country uh, to, to just reach the whole country for Christ. And uh, I just have to say, uh, the Baptist Association here in North Carolina, uh, who I'm new to, has just done an absolutely fantastic ministry. So support it, pray for them, pray for the people of Armenia, and if God gives you the opportunity to go, don't hesitate. It's an opportunity to serve the Lord. Thanks for this time, I appreciate it. You can advance slides. That'll will it do it. Just let it let it advance while I talk. When we go, when we've been taking teens to Armenia, we pack. Up, everyone gets two suitcases. One suitcase is for your own personal belongings. The second suitcase or container is for vacation Bible school materials. We do not have to bring as much as we used to because now we can start buying a lot of stuff over there and using them there, and it's a lot cheaper to do so. However, we do need hair bows for girls. We have plenty of Hot Wheel cars to give away to boys in the Bible school, but we need hair bows for girls. So if you want to get some hair bows to the association office between now and when we, and between, between now and like the 31st of July, that would be helpful. Um, also, if you have old glasses, reading glasses or prescription glasses, um, we, can we will take those with us. Uh, Armenia's healthcare system is like being in the early to late 60s here, except for dental care. Dental care is really superior. A lot of people who have Armenian descent here in America will fly to Armenia, get their root canal done and a crown done for pennies on the dollar for what you can do there. I know some who've done that. Um, I might even do that. But uh, the, um, <laughs> I'm I've got two do right here, two implants. But um, we, t we do VBS supplies, and um, we go, our routine is we start 8 o'clock in the morning, we have breakfast, and then we travel to a church near the seminary, which is um, about where the M is under the word Armenia, there on your map, and we'll fan out a two-hour radius around that and go to a church and do that church that day. Um, sometimes we'll do a vacation Bible school in the morning and then another in the afternoon. Sometimes we'll go to an orphanage in the afternoon, uh, do a glasses clinic, et cetera. So, so we, we fan out, but we always try to share the name of Jesus and how to be saved. And so that, that, is, that is a tr strategic thing we're doing. When we go this next summer, we're going to go down. Think of, I look at Armenia on the map like a chicken leg, kind of at an angle, sticking up. And we're going to go down to the handle of the chicken leg. And uh, that's a good Baptist symbol, by the way. You, you ever seen somebody who said, we'll work for food, I'll preach for chicken? We're going to be going down to that area. We have a church planner. We are not sponsoring them. Someone else is sponsoring them in Marie, which is on the Persian border. And we hopefully will be going right there. When I say on the, on the, on the border, from here to that window is a barbed wire. And they are reaching Persians 
in high numbers. And um, um, because they're not near anything, when this Armenian couple needs to go shopping, they actually go across the border for about five miles and get something there to get their food and groceries. So, um, um, so we're doing Bible schools. This last time, though, we are doing adult clinics for women, and we're planning on doing them for men. We realize a lot of these people, though they live in the land of Noah, that's what Armenia calls themselves, they live in the land of Noah, they do not know the story about Noah and the Ark. They do not know the creation narratives. When you're Armenian, you go to the Armenian Apostolic Church. They don't want to be called Orthodox, but that's what we tend to call them. They go to church twice in their life. When you're a baby, you're sprinkled. And the next time you go is when you are a parent and you bring your baby to be sprinkled. But that's it. So we're helping to reestablish faith in the country, a relationship with Jesus. When we go into going to Karabakh, we've been going now, we've gone 17 times to Karabakh. We know we're followed. They are still in kind of a Russian way of thinking. They don't trust Americans. When I went to prayer walk that in 2005 with Asatur Nehapatian, there'll be a test later. Asatur Nehapatian is the executive director of the Menian Baptist Convention. And um, I was the first American they had ever seen. When we had an African-American pastor go with us several years later, you know he got a lot of attention. They've never seen a black person in, in, in person. I bet while we were there that two weeks, I bet he had literally a thousand people come up, photo, photo, do selfies with him. He, he loved it. He had a ball. We know what followed. We, the, our first two years in that area, we did sports evangelism. The second year, by the way, we were there, we also, did, um, we also did vacation Bible school. And then the remaining years, we've done vacation Bible schools and discipling of some of the mothers. Um, and, and, and what's neat is the mothers want to come to Bible school because they never use, cray use crayons and colored either. When you have 78% unemployment, you don't have resources. And you can have a room full of 300 children, and we did from four and five year old up to 13 and they're orderly and they respect authority. Kind of hard when you go to our schools today how that is. Our first five years there, we met always with the principal after school. We gave them uniforms from over the basketballs that our churches had not used. And they told us they could not, they had an interest city Sports League and their schools, the junior high school, could not participate because they couldn't afford uniforms. They didn't have them. And so now they'd be able to be, have, wear uniforms. So they're really excited for that. We would give them $200 to buy something for the school, which is about $1,000 buying power here in America. And we gave them sports equipment, gifts. You know, we gave them basketballs, basketball nets, pumps, um, and some other sporting equipment. And they're absolutely thrilled, thrilled. And, and then he, they give us some food and, and they um, um, just, they ask us, please keep coming back. Please keep coming back. After being going to there about four years, they put the Ten Commandments up in every hallway, at crosses in every classroom in the public school. Our fifth year there, we're meeting with the principal, the assistant principal. We're exchanging gifts. They're so thrilled. Please keep coming back. And they wanted pictures of every team that had been there. And they put the pictures outside the principal's office of every team that had been there. But when we went that fifth year, there was a gentleman there, an older gentleman, who was with security, with the security, the KGB, so to speak, of Armenia. And he wanted to meet with us and said, everything that you Americans have done, I, everything that you said you would do, you have done. And we're asking you to please keep coming back. There you go. That's the enclave where we go. We're asking you to keep, please keep coming back. My grandfather said before the communists took over, our churches were strong. We knew our Bible. You are teaching our children the Bible again. We don't have money for summer programs. You're giving them a summer program that we don't have the money to do. And we know that as goes the church will go Armenia. So we're asking you to please keep coming back. My grandfather said that before the communists took over, we knew a Bible 
and you're teaching our children the Bible again. Please continue. Y'all, we, here we've done this much, and we did this much, and then this KGB or intelligence officers, please. And they also followed us to make sure that we weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Y'all, how can we not go back? You will never hear anyone refuse to hear the gospel. And if you've never been overseas on a mission trip, it's a good first place to go because you don't have to eat strange things like monkey brains and snakes. It's mostly chicken and pork. And a little bit sometimes of some beef. So you don't have to eat anything unusual. And, and when you go, you eat to the point of sin and you think you're gaining weight to you get back. Everything's organic. You lose weight. <laughs> I lost six pounds thinking I was gaining as much as I was eating. I lost six pounds while I was there. And by the way, I've lost two more, Joe. But um, I'm working on it. You know, the Lord is doing great work all over the world. If you go in Islamic countries, as Paul says, old men will have visions and young men will, have, will dream dreams. In Islam, since 9-11, 20 years ago, the church started praying more. In Islamic countries, the, look, the, the, the young people are coming to Christ by the tens of thousands, especially in Iran. I got to have a meeting with Jim Slack, who is the head missiologist for the Southern Baptist International Mission Board. He told me that the young people in Iran are coming to Christ by the tens of thousands. Oops. <laughs> tens of thousands, and the government is terrified because they can't stop it. We avoid a war. They expect it to collapse from within. We had three women in one church and two in another come forward at the end of an, in, at the invitation to request prayer for healing. This is not a church. Our me and Baptists are very formal. They're not Pentecostal like, but they came and they prayed over them and they were healed. And so in Islamic countries. They're having visions and dreams. Jesus is coming to people in visions and dreams and speaking to them directly. You talk to our missionaries who are in, in, in these countries, they'll tell you about it. One of my best friends was a missionary in Indonesia. One of the main Islamic leaders in the country of Indonesia was on the Hajj. Now, every, every Islamic believer is required at some point in their life to go to Saudi Arabia, go to Mecca, and walk around the rock at least one time in their lifetime. He was on his Hajj. He's one of the main leaders of Islam. And there, Jesus, like Paul on the Damascus Road, Jesus appeared to him and said, it is time that you stop fighting me and you followed me. And so he comes back to Indonesia and he finds my friend who's a missionary in Indonesia and he says, I need you to protect me because when they find out I've become Christian, they're going to kill me. Armenia has a place in world history. The Lord is using it to impact his neighbors, but continue to pray for that, though God is doing a work all over the world. Christianity is growing on every continent except North America. Think about it. One of my favorite hymns, I think it's in Christ there is no east or west, it says, while Western cultures own their Lord, others attend his word. If I ever hear any of you say, we can't do that, it's not in the budget, I want to say, so what? If the Lord is leading you to do it, do it. Money follows mission. What's the mission of this church? A budget is nothing but a planning tool. Many churches across our nation now are going to six months budgets and it's not year-long budgets. How do we allocate and use our funds outside our building and not just bless ourselves? As the Lord, I think the Lord is using COVID to help purify his church and move us from churchianity to Christianity. When you become a Christian in Armenia, that means you're not a leader of the apostolic church, and you even get persecuted in Armenia when you become Christian or Baptist. And they say, so what? Christ means more. My second time in Armenia, our third night there, we had 17 Persians come and were staying at the seminary. They were believers, they were Christians. And they were thrilled, the ladies would take off their 
head coverings, and they had freedom. And, and many of us stayed up late night fellowshipping with them, having open fellowship. At first, we were scared of them, and they were scared of us. But after a couple of nights, we were hugging each other and staying up late, late night playing games with the Persians. And the last night they were there, we were there two weeks, they were there for one week. My daughter and I were invited to join them to go down into a river that's flowing off of Mount Ararat and um, participate with them in the baptismal service. Uh, my translator explained that because they are being baptized, that's the line of demarcation. You see, biblically speaking, the public profession of faith is not coming down front and shaking the preacher's hand. It is baptism. That's your public profession of faith. That's the line of demarcation in Persia. He says because they're being baptized into Christ when they go back to their country. The, if you're a man, you're disfellowship from your family. You're kicked out of the home. If you're a student, you're kicked out of school. You lose your driver's license. You lose your job. But we have freedom of religion they would say, but you have no rights as a human being. If you're a female, I mean a woman or a girl, it is the family's responsibility, especially if they have a brother, to execute her in public, unless they renounce Christ. I had a wise deacon in my church, my last church I pastored near Charlotte, 80-year-old gentleman, he, uh, said, Brother Preacher, Ed Turrentine was a log truck driver and an antique dealer, and he was a hellion when he was young, and he got saved at 44 years old. He was an alcoholic, and the Lord, you're talking about a changed life. He was, was changed. I got to the church. He was 80 years old, and he had some of the best godly wisdom of anybody I ever met. He said, Brother Preacher, I've been thinking, and when he, Brother Ed said that, you might as well sit down. You're going to be there a while, but he said, America's not suffering from, pers from persecution. We're suffering from the lack of it. Hear me, we are never to seek persecution. We are to seek obedience. But the Lord today is purifying his church in North America. Will we stand? Will I stand? Lord, help us to be faithful in our Jerusalem and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm sorry my slide presentation couldn't show tonight, but to see the faces of these Armenian children and many of these boys that we witnessed to in Nagorno Karabakh, I know are dead. But we've had hundreds of them make professions of faith in Jesus. And they have been on ground zero. Because when you're 18 years old, you are required to be in the military in Armenia for two years minimum. How can we not go back? Oh! Oh! I don't see it on the, okay, thank you. But anyway, continue on for a few, and I'll bring a couple points up. That fellow on the left, he's a rascal. We put him in charge, and he can straighten up. <laughs> continue on. <laughs> and the gentleman with the hat, that's Jim Hendricks, who's pastor of Cherry Branch Baptist Church, as you hit over at the ferry across the Oriental. And um, Jim goes over, and he's been teaching welding. He owns a welding business, and teaching young men a trade so they can make a living. And while he's teaching them welding, he's teaching them Jesus in the Bible. And he stays in one spot up there at Lake Savan. Continue, keep those cycling. I didn't know that this was showing. Many of you know Steve Simpson, Pastor River Bend. Steve, one of the things when we go into a communist block housing apartment complex is we have to get their attention and get the kids out there to play Bible school. We blow bubbles and stuff. He brought bagpipes. That really brought them out in the parents too. I say, welcome to heaven, here's your harp. Welcome to hell, here's your bagpipes. But um, on the way back through, as we are coming through Dulles, they made them to the National Home Security, made them take out the bagpipes and play. And everybody in customs stopped and let them play, and then they applauded them. It was really good. Command performance. And he, explained, he, ex ex he exchanged spit with half the children of Armenia. The gentleman there, was standing beside me, is the pastor of Grimory Baptist Church. Very effective discipling pastor. He took this church had about five believers seven years ago, and now he's running in his church around 50 to 60. And we went there and did our glasses clinic. Continue on. This is the public school in Nagorno-Karabakh where we have been um, um, doing the vacation Bible school, the sports evangelism clinics, 
and we have two church planters in this area that we that we that you are sponsoring. Two hundred dollars a month is a living wage, a, a, a low living wage, but it's a living wage for in a in a country where seventy eight percent unemployment is a good living wage for a pastor. You have to be a graduate from the seminary, and the Bible says husband and one wife. So if you're not married, you're not going to be a pastor. Continue, but continue on. We'll wrap it up here because I think he's in about, 15, about five, ten minutes. But um, just some of these pictures. Here's a couple of people from Cape Carteret Baptist Church who are also went with us there at the school. And, um, and that's my youngest daughter, Rachel Lynn. When you go over there, you might as well be draped in the American flag. They all know you're American. Just the way we walk, they could tell we're American. But um, pray for Armenia. Pray for the protection of its borders. Pray the Lord's will be done because they are a launching point to not only their country, but a launching point for reach, spreading the gospel in that region of the world, period. It is my hope that you will pray that they will be bold, pray that they will not only reach their nation, but continue to be reaching their neighbors as well. God is doing marvelous things that will knock your socks off. And I come back here and I feel like Isaiah. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It calls us to purity. That's my oldest daughter. She was there and teaching the kids too. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. They are trying to become the, the Silicon Valley of the region. They don't have a lot of resources. Um, Azerbaijan has oil. They don't have oil. That's part of why during the crisis no one paid much attention to them. Um, but their resources, they, they don't have a lot of natural resources. They, they're, because it is a rocky, heavily rocky country, they don't have much, they barely have enough land to support themselves with food. Because it's, it's just only in some valley areas do they, can they grow the food they have to sustain themselves. So you can keep these rolling as I'm talking. Um, and um, anybody else, another question? Yes, sir. They want you to convert American dollars to drums. However, a lot of people will take your dollars, and exchange rate's about the highest I've ever seen it. Well, I've been there when the exchange rate was 395 drums to the dollar. It was 521, I think, when we were there. So it's really, the buying power of the dollar is much higher. This is the school. Here we are teaching women, uh, the mothers. Um, Bible lessons, salvation story, things like that while the kids are in Bible school. Anybody else? Average membership of a church runs around 25 to 50. There are a few churches that run over 100. I think Ichivan, Central Baptist in um, Yerevan, and um, um, Ararat, down on the Azari border. Anybody else? Yes. You cannot pastor in Armenia unless you have attended seminary and passed it. And you also have to be married. I don't care how much training you have, if you're not married, you're not going to pastor. <laughs> the children, in their eyes, their innocence of them will take your breath away. My wife went five times to Armenia, and she loves, she loves to tell the story of how this boy who was about 12 years old, and he had a little brother with him who was about six, and he was asking his big brother questions, and his brother just took him and grabbed his ears and came up and just gave him a kiss, you know, and, and just, my wife just went, oh. The older siblings take care of it. This is a church in Vanadzor, Vanadzor is a town of about 30,000, two-hour drive from the seminary. We, we, did you go there? You didn't go there when we went this time. Um, the church was full of black mold. They had an old building and full of black mold. And the, the association, that is, that's it there. The Atlantic Association paid for the architectural designs and renderings. 
for, you know, we gave them $1,100 to do that. And then Ashburr, First Baptist Ashburr, built their new church. And uh, one of the things that you can't really see there is the yard was full of marijuana. They didn't, they, they didn't even, they didn't care. It grows wild all over Ukraine and, West, and Eastern Europe. But um, um, it seems to be more of an American thing, I guess. But Vandenzor um, um, has had a lot of support as well. This is a church back in Nagorno Karabakh. The pastor here, we have sponsored him for almost 10 years. We have just stopped, by the way, we have just stopped supporting him to support someone else because he's established. And um, well, anytime you're preaching there, you have to, that's me preaching and my son in law, my, my soon to be son in law, interpreting for me, or interrupting might be a better word. You do a 20 minute message that's really 40 minutes because of the interpreter, so you have to be succinct. And, um, um, Overhead, it says in Armenian, Jesus is Lord. That church is, when we started with this church, they had about a dozen members, mostly elderly ladies, who had remembered when the church was active in Armenia. Now it's full of young people, really all ages, and this church now is running about 80 or 90. Um, they're doing really well. And that's looking at the, this is in the pastor's home looking down on construction. Any other questions? Yes, sir. It is. It, their root language is Armenian. Armenian is a root language like um, Greek is. It's a um, Cyrillic alphabet. They have 39 letters to their alphabet. It was given to them by a missionary, the equivalent of our Wycliffe missionaries. Let me tell you that story. Um, continue this going. And when you get to a monastery, a big looking monastery, and with the Ararat behind it, that's where you can stop. There, about the year 400, or a little earlier before that, a missionary came from the Mideast, went to see the king. They were animists. They believed in worshiping nature and animals and things like that, and told their king about the one true God. He called him an idiot. The king did, called the, called the missionary, the Christian missionary, an idiot, and had him thrown into a deep rock pit which was a death sentence, basically. And um, he lived off whatever lizards and lichens and whatever fell into the pit, and this older lady kept feeding him, throwing him bread. Fourteen years later, he's been living in this open air, this pit above, and the king's son got gravely sick. None of his holy men know the doctors could heal his son, and he said, I wish that holy man who came here years ago was still alive. Maybe he could do something. And this advisor said, um, Your Majesty, um, he is still alive. So they got him out of the pit, cleaned him up. He came and met, spoke to the king. He went to the son and prayed over his, the king's son, and he was healed. And that king said, from this day forward, Armenia will be a Christian nation. That was 14 years before Constantine had the Roman Empire to become a Christian nation. So their identity is, we're the first Christian nation. Stop right there. Leave it there. This, is, this monastery has been active for over 1,500 years. Can you imagine that? And you can go in this monastery and they have a room where you can go down and go down into this 30 feet, 40 foot deep pit. And um, it's pretty remarkable. But that's, and then, then after that, another missionary came and gave them their alphabet. And a lot of the identity of the Armenians themselves is in their alphabet as well. They were under the Soviet Union, so most of the older adults speak Russian as well. My daughter married an Armenian, and she's learning Armenian. She's gotten pretty fluent in it. And when her in-laws did not want her to understand, they would switch to Russian. And she goes, don't worry, Dan, I'm, watch I'm learning Russian, too. <laughs> so, but this is Kovi Rab. And to your right, about a kilometer to the east, is the Turkish border and Mount Ararat. Go one more slide, I think you'll see Mount Ararat. We were much closer than this picture here. That's the view from the seminary in Armenia. Armenian language is like a, you know how the French kind of get snooty with their language? They're not snooty, they're just proud. <laughs> and that is a lot of their identity is that they will not absorb their neighbor's languages. They want to keep their language pure for the sake of 
their identity as the first Christian nation, and it was given to them by a Christian missionary, their alphabet. Think about Wycliffe, but 1,400 years ago. Any other question? Well, I've stuttered and stammered my way through this, but you've been very attentive. Let's bow together, if we may. Father, you are doing marvelous things around this world. Lord, I confess to you my complacency. I've gotten accustomed to the same old, same old that I've known for the last 63 years. Father, help us to examine our own expectations and allow you to change them to realize that you are doing wonderful and marvelous things around the country and to believe that again here. Father, it was a faith vision that started this church and all the churches in this region. Faith will renew it. Give us faith, and with that, give us wisdom and give us courage that the gospel may again go forward in North America as it is around the world. Father, we are coming to a day where our government and other people around this nation are becoming hostile to our faith. May we stay faithful. Lord, your church is best and strongest when it is distinctive from the culture, not acting like it. So purify us, Father. Help us to do the soul searching we need to do that we may stand with love, with dignity, and, thus, and say, thus saith the Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much.